Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled 24-7 Automated Behavior Tracking for Rodent Safety Pharmacology and Phenotyping. My name is Martin Hess from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Today's session is the second installment in our Animal Behavioral Neuroscience webinar series. We are happy to share that over 400 scientists from around the world have registered to participate in this web series and I would like to extend a warm welcome to those of you who are online today. Thank you very much for being with us. Our session today is sponsored by Actual Analytics and will be focused around applications of a novel home cage analysis system for round-the-clock behavior monitoring of group housed rodents with retained identity in regular IVC racked home cages. We have three speakers participating in our webinar today. First, we will hear from David Craig, CEO of Actual Analytics, who will provide a brief history of his company and the actual HCA home cage analyzer technology. Next, we will be joined by Dr. Will Redfern, Associate Director of the Cardiovascular and CNS Translational Center of Expertise at AstraZeneca in the UK. Will has 30 years experience in behavioral pharmacology. He currently leads a team of in vitro and in vivo safety pharmacologists addressing cardiovascular and CNS safety issues. He has been an invited speaker at numerous international conferences and continuing education courses and is currently Vice President-Elect of the Safety Pharmacology Society. And last, we will hear from Dr. Sarah Wells, Director of the Mary Lyons Center at MRC Harwell in the UK. This is a large center for mouse genetics which supports the research of individual scientific groups as well as high throughput programs such as the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium or IMPC. Sarah is currently involved in many exciting projects including looking for the genetic causes of diseases of aging, metabolism and neurology by generating and characterizing the phenotypes of genetically modified mouse mutants. That's fabulous. Thank you Martin and thank you to everyone who's dialed in and listening. We have some excellent speakers today, so I'm not going to take up too much of their time. I wanted very briefly to let you know that Actual Analytics is a five-year-old company. Uh, our people are completely dedicated to delivering great products and to bringing great science to the community. We, uh, we've worked on a journey here where we've spent some time working both with, with Will at AstraZeneca and also with Sarah and her team at the MRC under two projects under a headline called Crack It, which has been uh, funded by and with the assistance of the NC3Rs. So before we talk about the product or anything, we just have to express our profound gratitude to the, all of those bodies and those people who've worked with us in bringing together what we think is a truly exciting product. The, the product itself, very, very simply, actual HCA stands for actual home cage analyzer, and it is the only product available which permits people like yourselves to gather 24-7 data with automated analysis of complex behaviors of group housed rodents and importantly identity retained and in the real home cage, not some separate apparatus but in those IVC racks that you know and love from uh, the various vendors uh, including people like Technoplast and Allentown. There are substantial 3 hours cost and scientific benefits from the system. And uh, we're really excited about it. We're really excited about today's presentation, and we're really excited about getting the opportunity today to share that with you. Uh, without further ado, then, I'm going to hand back to Martin at this point. Okay. I'd like to first of all thank Martin Hess and Andy Henton for their help with the presentation. And good afternoon or good morning, everybody. So this is um, this talks about a home cage automated monitoring system in rats and um, first of all to start with a uh, to show there's no conflict of interest this is just a quick disclaimer that um, we um, have no vested interest in this product commercially so the world that I work in is in the preclinical um, assessment of safety of new drugs and this was some work from my colleagues at AstraZeneca that was published last year. 
showing that if drugs that stop uh, due to um, various causes, 60% of the project closures were safety related. And as you can see, um, as you would hope for as well, the majority of these are of, or bulk of these are found preclinically and as you go through the clinical phases, a larger contribution is due to efficacy failure. But if you could actually shave off even a small percentage of these safety related failures, you would free up the pipeline to get drugs to patients faster or drugs that, that were safe faster. So part of my role is to try to identify these safety issues earlier. And this table shows what are the major causes of um, failures due to safety. So first of all, lack of early detection of safety signals so that, if you like, doomed compounds or compounds doomed to fail enter the in vivo toxicology phase, which is done prior to human clinical trials. The second cause is, is um, lack of detection um, in that phase, and so, if you like, doomed compound enter clinical development and then fail there, where, where it's expensive. And then thirdly, lack of confidence in the translation from preclinical to clinical. But what I want to focus on here is the middle one. Um, and one solution is to improve the uh, quality and increase the information content of safety pharmacology and toxicology studies. So if you identify the contribution of different organ systems to the safety related um, failure of drugs, uh, this league table goes from non-clinical through the clinical phases into marketing. And this is a list of the organ systems in order of failure in the um, marketing phase. But if you look here, the failures due to nervous system toxicity uh, dominate the um, causes of failure during clinical development. And so this is an area that again, just to repeat, if we could shave off a small percentage of this, we would be making quite a big difference. So traditionally, the ways to study adverse effects of drugs on the nervous system involve a variety of in vitro, in vivo, and post-mortem histology approaches. And in the in vivo uh, approaches, um, one of the mainstays is behavioral neurological assessments. The standard test for a global um, evaluation of effects on the nervous system is either the Irwin test, uh, which was originally developed in mice, or the functional observational battery that was um, developed in rats. And these are multi-parameter assessments involving observations both in the home cage and in an arena. And when you place rats in, in an arena, this will stimulate more activity. And there's also manual interaction to test sensory motor reflexes. The, these are limited to snapshot observations at specified time point, points pre and post dose. The principles of the two tests are similar. And if you like, um, you can divide it into four domains, so autonomic effects such as piloerection and um, body temperature, neurological effects including gait and uh, convulsions, sensory motor effects, um, so these are reflex responses, and behavioral um, observations including activity, rearing and um, bizarre behavior and stereotypy. And these um, two tests have been evaluated and validated pharmacologically. Another approach, particularly to look at the effects of drugs on activity, is locomotor activity. And this either is done in, the, in a novel arena or in a home cage situation. So in a novel arena, 
animals uh, such as rats will explore the novel environment um, and there are really two phases of the locomotor activity, an initial exploratory phase followed by habituation. Whereas in the home cage, um, there is no anxiety component of being placed in a novel arena and you get a, a consistent pattern of circadian rhythm in terms of the activity with higher activity during the dark phase or even just darkness. And the methods to do this either involve a matrix of infrared beams or video tracking. The problem is that you have to place animals singly for uh, most of these um, assessments. Just to show you spontaneous activity in a novel arena, so activity is initially high and then decays over time and then reach, reaches a, a plateau after about 15 to 20 minutes. If you dose them with a sedative drug, you can detect this quite quickly. Um, whereas with a stimulant drug, initially it's difficult to detect the activity because the activity of the vehicle control animals is quite high, but in the, in the stimulant dosed animals, the activity remains high during the period. So these locomotor activity tests have been used um, extensively over years and are very reliable. But the question is, is it time for new technology? And we all have the same issue where we're all extremely busy. Um, and so, again, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy days to um, listen to this uh, presentation. So back in 2011, I was, and even before then, I was asking the question to myself, what if you could monitor the activity of each individual rat within a group in a standard home cage over 24 hours or longer? What if you could also monitor their temperature, achieve this without the need for surgery, even if you could detect uh, convulsions and other abnormal behaviours? And what if you could achieve all this without having to modify the home cage or take up um, a a, a specific room or a laboratory, in other words, being able to do it in a standard individually ventilated cage rack which you could wheel anywhere like any other cage rack. So how would, would we do this? Well, back in 2011, the NC3Rs launched an open innovation platform called Crackit, and this has two components. Um, uh, a chal Cracket Challenge, um, which is a competition, which I'll come on to in a minute, and also Cracket Solutions. And you can have a look at their website to get more in information on this. But in terms of the challenge, which is what we were involved in, so we were a sponsor, and I basically submitted that technology challenge that I've just described. Um, NC3Rs invites innovators to enter the competition and they uh, discuss the proposals with the sponsors and then an expert panel selects the winning solution. The NC3Rs fund the development and then the three work together to deliver the solution. So this was termed the Rodent Big Brother project and um, basically the remit was as described, and the winning solution was awarded to Actual Analytics, who are based in Edinburgh. The project itself got underway in 2012, and AstraZeneca's in-kind contribution has been intellectual input and annotation of video to train the behavioral recognition software. And we also aim to detect uh, convulsions, ultimately. So. Positional information and temperature was achieved via a subcutaneously injected RFID microchip, which we were already using to measure temperature using a remote wand. Um, and this was um, what actual analytics did was to develop a base plate reader that sat under the cage. And then behavior was captured via a high resolution camera positioned to the side of the cage. Um, and the cage itself was illuminated by infrared lighting that gave 24-hour um, lighting. Um, so we're currently undergoing, 
undertaking a full evaluation and pharmacological validation. So in our world, what we want to do is incorporate it into early investigative toxicology studies in rats. So this shows the sort of size of the RFID microchip, and that's injected subcutaneously in the rat. And this probably shows a better image of the, the setup. So within a standard cage rack, um, you've got one of the modules is um, basically given over to the camera and the microcomputer that um, stores the data. And there's a base plate monitor under the cage as described here. Okay. So what it's able to do in terms of manual annotation of video, we've been capturing um, video from both the light and dark phase and then manually annotating individually individual behaviors and this will train the behavioral recognition software to for example, identify rearing, uh, grooming, eating, and all various other behaviors that we've listed. So part of our user acceptance testing and validation are, are addressing the following questions, which I won't go through in great detail, but for example, um, do XY data from the base plate tally with manual XY data using a bird's eye view camera? Um, can the system detect pharmacologically induced changes in activity and temperature? And we've got a probably a more extensive list of this than this that we're actually working through right now. So um, in terms of annotating behaviors, this is um, a list of some of the most common behaviors me measuring. So um, scratching behavior, believe it or not, is probably top of the list, um, followed by rearing and various other grooming behaviors and eating and drinking. So when you've got a significant number of events, and depending on, on what the actual image content is of the behavior, you know, determines how many events you need to reliably train the software, but we're really trying to go uh, and get as many episodes as we can. This shows um, the side view of the cage, so it captures the whole of the um, view, so that's the front of the cage and that's the rear. And you can see the infrared lighting here, and this is a plastic play tunnel that is actually red, but in infrared it appears, um, actually infrared it appears um, transparent. In terms of the base plate activity, you can see um, an individual actigram plot here showing circadian um, rhythm in terms of higher activity during the dark phase. And um, if you get group data, so this is temperature and activity, you can see a nice circadian rhythm in both activity and temperature in the group of rats housed three per cage. In terms of the periodicity, um, you can see uh, higher activity during the dark phase, and uh, a periodogram shows a peak, this is like Fourier analysis, showing a peak at 24 hours where, where you'd hope it would be, and what Actual are doing at the moment is uh, fine-tuning the filter algorithms to minimize registering of micro-movements between adjacent anten antennae in the base plate during periods of low ambulatory activity so that this will drive down these peaks in the um, daytime. So um, that's happening right now. You start throwing up some interesting data when you use a system like this and this shows the effect of single housing rats after they've been group housed and obviously rats are social animals and you can see in the red plot this is um, the subcutaneous temperature during group housing and when they are single housed um, there's a decrease in temperature compared to the group house situation which is probably due to 
lack of opportunities for huddling against their warm companions and probably a slight drop in ambient temperature within the cage. Uh, but again, it shows uh, the importance of group housing rodents. So just to summarize the advantages, this is a technological breakthrough and it really wasn't possible to collect data like this before now. So it enables continuous 24-hour monitoring over days and weeks, increases the information content of existing study types, so we'd be doing these studies anyway um, and we're getting more data out of them. Animals are able to be housed in social groups. Apart from a subcutaneous injection of a, of a microchip, it's non-invasive. We don't need to modify the standard housing cages. The um, modules fit inside a standard IVC cage rack, so you don't need a bench top for it in a dedicated room. And also, um, we are not using additional animals to uh, obtain this data. This is on animals within the existing studies. And future developments include automated detection of convulsive behaviors. Outside um, safety assessment, um, I can see potential for looking at drug withdrawal phenomena. So one of the, uh, if we have centrally acting drugs, we have to look at the effects of what happens after you dose them for say three weeks and then cease the dosing. And this would um, be a, an excellent approach to, to measuring behavioral and temperature changes and feeding changes that occur on drug uh, withdrawal. You can imagine it in drug discovery for CNS active drugs and in academic research looking at disease models, circadian rhythms, aging and in phenotyping of rats which are become, uh, beginning to become um, available. I'd like to uh, finish by thanking my colleagues in AstraZeneca and Actual Analytics and Judith Pratt at the University of Strathclyde, but a uh, particular thanks to three colleagues at the NC3Rs, Catherine Chapman, Cathy Vickers and Vicky Hello, Robinson. thank you very much. Um, hello, Martin, and thanks everybody for joining us today. So Will's given us a very comprehensive discussion about um, what, why we might use this type of caging for rats. And um, I'm going to talk today about, about mice and about what use this, this caging and this new type of phenotyping may be for mice. So, of course, um, this project is, is also part of the Crackit program. Um, and I should just say that the Crackit program is driven and funded by this organization called the National Center for the Three R's, which is a, a organization within the UK that's part funded by some government agencies, including some of the research councils. Um, and they really drive the refinement and the reduction and the replacement of animals in, in research in the UK. Um, they work in a way such that, that they drive this, this uh, uh, move towards the three R's by trying to improve science and so that we need to use less animals and that we can gain more information from the animals we use. And this is really at the heart of this project. The Crackit programs are for technological developments, but they're really of a, of a, a special spin on this. So they're of developments that, that we all really thought may not be possible or may not be possible um, at the moment and are real challenges, so real innovation challenges. They're not easy wins, any of these projects, and I think both Will and, and Actual Analytics would agree with me that these are, these are difficult, tricky pro projects, but in actual fact, the delivery and the results from these projects is going to be fantastic. So as I said, we, it, I work on mice, and so hence we, came, we come a year after the project of Rodent Big Brother, which we all started. So we're called Rodent Little Brother. Um, I work at MRC Harwell, and we study, um, this is a, a big government research place in the UK, uh, just south of Oxford, and we study the genetics of diseases, and we are sponsors in this project. So we were really seeking refinements to characterize mouse models. And we sought conversations with the NC3Rs, having seen the, the beginning of the project with, with Will and with AstraZeneca. And we sought, we sought their advice on how we could advance this technology and entered into this Crackit pro project with Actual Analytics. And this really is, this really is a project where the sponsors um, give their academic knowledge, but also um, their, their time and um, some, of their, some of their resources that they have. And they work with the developers in a hand-in-hand -hand collaboration to, to solve a very difficult problem. 
So just let me tell you a little bit about MRC Harwell. Um, the building that you can see on your slide is actually um, a big mouse facility. Um, we like to think ourselves of a, as a dynamic and progressive facility, hence we're constantly seeking improvements into the data and, and into the scientific data we're collecting. We have extensive resources for mouse research and we provide a national and international lead in laboratory animal science, both within the UK and, within our, and with our partners in international mouse genetics. But we really have a, song, a serious commitment to reduction, refinement and reproducibility of mouse data. Hence our, our, our um, interest in getting involved in this project and our enthusiasm and excitement as, as the project goes on. So just to give you a few facts and figures at the scale of, of MRC Harwell, we were opened 11 years ago. We have capacity for about 55,000 mice at any one time. And along, along with mouse housing and mouse phenotyping, we have significant molecular biology and pathology capacities, and we're currently running at full capacity. Uh, some figures for you, in 2014 alone, we performed 230,000 regulated procedures, that is procedures regulated by the, by the um, uh, UK Home Office. We generated 120, 25 new transgenic models, and we exported 320 different GA lines to, to um, the biomedical community. And really, we are a service delivery unit, so we have no uh, research ourselves, but we, but we um, concentrate on science-led delivery service. I want to tell you about one of the main projects that, that the um, MRC Harbour supports, and that's the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium. And this is a consortia of mouse, of mouse facilities around the world, including Canada, including the US, including the Far East, and our, and our colleagues in Europe, that are trying to um, phenotype uh, null alleles of all the genes in the mouse genome to put together a, a comprehensive and functional catalog of, mammalian, of the mammalian genome. If you look at the URL that's displayed here, you will see currently phenotyping data for about 1,700 genes, and this grows daily and weekly. And so the end of the first phase of this, we are hoping, and we will within about 18 months, we'll have phenotyping data for 5,000 of the genes in the mouse genome. And we will continue this effort in the coming years. So just to tell you a little bit about the context of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, this was, this was, uh, this, uh, ideas for this project were really put together on the facts that the function of the majority of the genes stunningly, actually, in, the day, in our days of genomics now, is actually unknown, and that knockouts have only actually been genera generated and analyzed for about a third of mouse genes. Um, I think all of those working on, working on, um, on bioinformatics and, and looking at the data will see that data for these genes is patchy, and it's dependent upon the interest and the experience of the investigators. So you don't necessarily get all of the data for a single gene, just the data of the, the specific field that the investigator is interested in. There is, a, there is an increased attention we know throughout the scientific community for reproducibility and reliability. And so really the IMPC has developed an approach for broad-based phenotyping to provide a comprehensive picture of disease states and to integrate this very closely with human and clinical genetics. And we, are, uh, and we have connections with and work with um, rare disease consortia, biobanks and genomics projects. So why were we particularly interested in, 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 um, ex in getting involved in this project and to do behavioral monitoring? Well, I think if you, if you work for the Medical Research Council, then, then there is the, you really have to address what the medical needs are of, of the country you're working in or the, medical, the current medical needs of the population. And these are some figures um, uh, taken from, from um, the Neurological um, Alliance that, that actually paint a picture of the need for studies into neuroscience within the UK. So, so there's estimated about 8 million people within the UK are living with some sort of neurobehavioral condition about a million of which find this condition, this condition disabling in some way. And about a third of a million actually require help with, their most, with most of their daily activities because of this neurological disorder, so a massive clinical need. Of course, these these, the, some of these diseases are being addressed by the genomics projects, but we know that mouse models and, and animal models are widely used to research research neurological diseases, and that's because of the similarity between the mouse and the human genes, and also the physiological and anatomical similarities between mouse and humans. The only thing is that with using a mouse as a, as a model for a human disease, 
we, we, and we hit one hurdle, and that is we can't actually ask the mice how they're feeling. We can't ask them questions. So we need to start working up a picture and working up um, experimental assays where we can assess the well-being of the mouse. And we do this by assessing normal behaviours such as digging and climbing and nesting. But how can you measure the signs of neurological disease? You can measure abnormal signs, and we can do this in, a, in our regular um, and our current behavioural platforms. So you can measure um, behaviours such as hyperactivity, you can measure social isolation, you can also measure disrupted sleep. But this, there's a major challenge to measuring mouse behaviour, and measuring mouse behaviour in the laboratory, and that is that it changes during the day. And you can see here, this is, this is a, a recording out of um, our circadian rhythm, um, our circadian rhythm equipment, which shows that, that um, on, the, on the blue section here, these are when the, our lights are on, but um, the mice are asleep. And then when the lights go off, you can see these black lines represent the mice running more. So mice are much more active during our dark phase and during their, and during their, light, um, their day. And when we're around during the day, when we come into work, which is our light, light phase, and we can see the cages, those mice are naturally want to be asleep. There are some other challenges. Mice like being with other mice, and mice do not like being in new places. So placing a mouse on its own when it has been socially housed, as you can see from wheels, it has temperature effects on rats, but it'll also have behavioral effects. And sometimes if you monitor the weights of mice when you've, when you've singly housed them from a group housing situation, you will see their weights drop. And there is a growing concern um, on the welfare side of things that it actually is quite cruel to house a mouse on its own, especially in a situation such as an IBC, where, that, where they don't have any other environmental cues and that they don't have any other smells or, or many noises from externally. It's a bit like solitary confinement, people say. Also, mice don't like new places, so we can measure animals, we can measure their activity very well in arenas, but they don't like to be in them, and it, and, it, and it makes the mice go into a state of anxiety. And that state of anxiety can actually confound your experimental, um, your experimental measurements. So the environment can be stressful, we know that, and they don't like to be on their own. So the Crackit program really addresses these challenges. A, we want to monitor them 24 hours a day. We don't want to just monitor them when we come, in, when we come into the mouse rooms and the lights are on in our daytime. We want to monitor them in their home cages because we don't want to put them in areas where they're stressful. And we want to monitor them with their cage mates because we think that there are welfare issues with them being on their own. But there are also issues that, that we, behaviors we won't be able to measure if they're on their own. And we won't be able to measure those social interaction behaviors. So the goal is, is obvious when you see what the challenge is. And that is to refine the test, is to gain vital scientific information, and to record more data from less mice. So, Rodent Little Brother looks quite a lot right, like Rodent Big Brother, apart from it's a little bit smaller. Um, and I think that, that having to decrease the size of, of the distance between the camera and the cage, and having to increase the sensitivity of the base plates which read the chips, um, has really been a technical challenge. But, but we're really showing some great data at the moment. And so the same as with, with Rodent Big Brother, there are high resolution cameras at the side of the cage, and there are also um, base plates which monitor the chips and the animals moving. And doing this, we can measure what, what people think are, are very um, strong signs of, social, um, social, of neurological diseases. And these include social isolation, hyper or hyperactivity, and sleep disturbances. So I'm just going to show you a clip of, of some of our mice running around their cage. And interestingly enough, as we start to study this, this video footage more and more, I think we will reveal novel behaviours that we haven't been able to measure in the past. Interactions with each other, the order animals groom, whether there's any dominance in the cage, which will be very important for measuring behaviours in the future. But not just for neurological diseases, for lots of other types of diseases, such as metabolic diseases. So this is just an example of, of the circadian rhythm that you can measure in the cage. And you can see that clearly the, the grey blocks are where the lights go out and the animals become more active, and that we're measuring circadian rhythms very nicely in these cages. So we don't just want to measure their activity, though. The challenge is more complex behaviours. And we need to automate this system so that it automatically picks up these more complex um, 
these more complex behaviors. And to do this, we've, we've gone through a process of, of training the software and uh, the clever guys who can do algorithms and machine learning uh, can run machine learning programs have been, have been working on the annotation that we've been given them. So we start off by capturing, vi um, capturing video and then we have a team of, of um, people who there are actually animal care workers who are very used to what animals look like and can really pick up different behaviors in the animals and they've been annotating these videos using automated annotation software so been telling the video when when an animal is grooming when an animal was, is climbing when it's rearing when it's grooming another animal and we've fed these back to actual analytics and the machine learning guys are now calculating the algorithms to be able to automate the system so that you'll be able to go on and you'll be able to tell what animal is grooming which animal and how much grooming is going on in a cage whether they're climbing or they're rearing and we'll really get an insight to the to the behavior of these animals so really I've said what our future aims and targets are we don't just want to do activity we, we find that very interesting but we don't just want to do activity we want to see a whole range of complicated behaviors we think on top of this we were going to be able to gather much more data from individual mice. From, we're going to be able to gather novel behaviors, there's going to be no environmental factors and nothing that's unknown to the mouse. So we're not going to be putting the mice in an arena that they don't know about or housing them singly. So I think that's me done. I think this is an amazingly exciting project and I look forward to talking to you in the future and showing you some of this automated be, um, uh, behavior and analysis. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that very informative and interesting uh, presentation. Um, okay. I, I was really amazed that um, only 35% of uh, the mouse gene knockouts have been generated and analyzed for only 35%. I would have thought that number would be much higher. And I suppose the social interactions are very important for phenotyping the rest of, of the genes. We're at 1,700 today, I suppose. Okay, uh, we have had um, lots of questions come in during our speaker presentations. We have approximately uh, 15 more minutes left, so what I'm going to do is we're going to start our Q&A session. I'm going to bring all our speakers back to participate in our question and answer session. So let's start with Will Redfern. Will, I've just unmuted your microphone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Fantastic. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you so much. And David, Craig, I'm going to unmute your microphone. Can you hear me all right, David? I can indeed. Thank you. Great. And um, at this point in time, just for our audience, uh, I'd like to mention briefly that we are being joined uh, during our Q&A session by Douglas Armstrong, who is the Chief Scientific Officer at Actual Analytics. Uh, Dr. Armstrong is also a professor in the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh where he holds the chair in systems biology and he's going to help us answer some of the scientific questions. So Douglas, welcome to our Q&A session. Thank you. All right, so we have quite a few questions here. Let's start with um, questions about how data is saved and analyzed. Uh, specifically, you know, what is the, the file format? Uh, how does one get data out and how quickly can uh, one get data um, you know, out of the system so that it can be further analyzed and consumed? Uh, Douglas, can we start with you to answer yeah. that question? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's, it's probably worth me just spending a minute describing how the, the system actually deals with data. So each of the cages has a small local computer that's gathering the, the raw data, that's the video feed and the feed from the, the base plate um, from the RFID detectors. That's stored locally and it's kept, it's kept safe and then there's a server unit which goes round each of the cages and gathers that data every few minutes. Um, and one of the things is obviously you want to be able to see this not at the end of the experiment but at any one time. So you can actually log into the server and actually get a report on, on what has been saved, you can look at the video, you can see the overlays and as soon as that data is on the server it's also starting to do the analysis, it's starting to overlay some of the behavioral analytics onto that data. Um, so yeah, you, you can get an analysis happening during an experiment, so within 15 minutes say you've actually got access to data and results, uh, you can sample that data and get it in a, a more 
easy, easy to, to communicate format, say Excel, uh, or into any statistical package. Does that help? Okay, fantastic. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That, that certainly does. Uh, Will, Will and Sarah, do you have anything to add um, to what uh, Douglas just had to, to say? Uh, I guess I would just add that, that it's, it's worth thinking up strategies for saving this data because, of course, as the analysis becomes more sophisticated, there's an opportunity to return to it. Okay, perfect. Yes, I have nothing to add to that. Okay, fantastic. Uh, another question, um, you know, Sarah, you specifically did mention the three R's benefits um, provided by a system like this. Can you elaborate and just talk about what some of the three R's benefits are of the actual HCA? So I think one of the most exciting things for, for us to consider is that we may actually be able to see some um, early phenotypes. So those phenotypes that, that appear in maybe a neurodegenerative model, but appear very rarely starting off maybe once or twice a day, maybe, maybe during, the light, uh, during the dark phase, very early tremors, maybe seizures that we don't see, so that we will actually be able to, to refine our, our disease models to be able to um, have points of early intervention. And I think that that's really exciting in terms of being able to pick up when animals are sick or getting sick. And in terms of, of moving towards drug therapies, that's absolutely what you want for, with neurodegenerative diseases. You don't want the animal to have got so sick that, that, that the pathology is so advanced that it's not, it's not, um, uh, you can do nothing about it, it's not druggable. I also think that there's a massive opportunity for reduction in animals here. So using less animals but recording them more often and using longitudinal studies which will be statistically stronger than big animal groups in, in single studies. So I think that's, that's a really interesting prospect. Okay, fantastic. Will, do you have anything to add to that, what some of the three RS benefits are of a system like this? Yeah, just to start, the, the three R's are reduction, refinement and replacement. Obviously we're not replacing animals here, but in terms of reduction in the use in toxicology studies and safety pharmacology, we would probably be able to use this system in place of standalone locomotor activity studies, which do would then normally nowadays require a, an additional group of animals. Um, and in terms of refinement, in toxicology studies, by their very nature, in the high dose groups um, of repeat dose tox studies, which are dosed at the maximum tolerated dose, you will get outlier animals that are more susceptible. And this system would enable you to detect uh, animals at risk, and you would see, um, you know, that maybe overnight there'd been an animal that had had a reduced activity, or possibly hadn't been feeding, and that would supplement um, decisions made on on a welfare basis. So, you know, I can see both on the data um, for the scientific data and in terms of welfare impact that this would be quite helpful system. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Douglas, do you have anything to add from your perspective? Just a brief point that um, because we have the identity of each of the animals, uh, in certain studies you can actually mix the treatment groups into, into different cages and that actually gives you a data point per cage per animal and actually that's allowed some of the, the early studies to actually reduce the number of animals they've needed to get the same statistical power. Okay, great. Fantastic. Um, just looking here, so uh, what else could the system be used for beyond the examples that were shown today? Will, I'll start with you. You did bring up a slide towards the end there, but um, can you maybe just elaborate on some other exciting things that you see in store or what's maybe yeah. perhaps most pertinent to you? Yeah, I did, I did um, cover this, but I think one that we want to particularly go at, and Sarah mentioned this as well, is uh, convulsions. Um, and these are only detected manually um, when the staff are actually around during the daylight phase, and obviously they can occur at any time of the night, at night or day. So the ability to detect an abnormal motor event, flag it up, and say, for example, you've got a log saying rat, 7, 3.40 a.m. abnormal motor event, then you've got the ability to manually assess the video at that time point just to verify that that was actually a convulsion. 
Um, that would be um, kind of the holy grail for us in toxicology studies. Okay. Perfect. And Sarah, do you have anything else to comment on in terms of what you see uh, as an example for a system like this beyond what was shown today by yourself and Will? I think there's an exciting prospect to be able to, to define aggression better and the aggressor versus the, the animals that are being, that are being attacked. In some in some GA models, aggression is a problem, um, and I also think that there's that and, and I think everybody will laugh at this, but I also think that there's a, a a big opportunity here to actually time matings properly, and I think for the embryologists, this will be very important. We put we put animals together to mate, and then we harvest embryos based on an arbitrary time we think they may have mated, and I think you could stage embryos, and you could you can really look at fertility if we could video it. Okay, perfect. And I assume convulsions, aggressive behavior, and all this, the mating behavior are all behaviors that you're scoring and analyzing now and, and um, are being... It's difficult to analyze. It's difficult to analyze mating behavior. You have to stand by a cage and wait for it to happen. So um, if you could do it in an automated way, it would make it much more logistically possible. Perfect. Douglas, can you comment on this question as well? So this is something that we've been thinking about when we designed the product. Uh, that people will always come up with new ideas uh, for things they want to do. And, and Will and Sarah have, have described the process through which we, we gather information to train the system to do something new. But we've designed it so that you keep all of the raw data, so that when something new comes along, you don't have to do the experiment again. You can take the new analysis algorithm and apply it to all of the old data and say, have we seen this before, or what would my experiment look like if I was interested in convulsions, for, for example. Okay, great. Just looking at the time here, we still have a few more minutes. Um, a question here uh, is, can the system be used and controlled remotely? For instance, over the weekend uh, when a lab would not regularly be monitored and people aren't around. Um, I don't know who wants to take a stab at this. Douglas, do you want to start, perhaps? Sure. Um, there's actually very little to control in the system once it's up and running, uh, and it is designed for days, weeks, up to up to months uh, in terms of study length. So yeah, it will run over the weekend without any intervention. There is the ability to export a live feed, so with appropriate network connections you could actually remotely connect into the system and see exactly what's happening live. Or as I've described earlier, if you log into the server you can also get with just a short delay to a period of minutes, you can start to get an analysis as well. Okay, perfect. Um, another question here, perhaps we'll just make this our last, is once you have a rack installed with the system, is it fixed or can the modules be taken in and out as needed? Again, I'll let uh, one of you three answer that question, whoever you feel is most the, the system itself is physically installed into the rack, so it's not going to be taking it in and out very particularly easily. But of course the cages aren't. You can swap the cages in and out, uh, 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 so uh, you don't have any problem. It's just, uh, it's, but it is installed into a physical rack. Uh, obviously if that doesn't suit, uh, you can get a desktop version, uh, but obviously it's based around the, the IBC rack as standard. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'd like to thank David Craig and Douglas Armstrong from Actual Analytics for their time today and for sponsoring this wonderful event. And finally, a huge thank you to Dr. Will Redfern and Dr. Sarah Wells for their fantastic presentations and for sharing the results they are collecting with this very exciting new technology. Just a final reminder to everyone that today's webinar has been recorded and will be made available for viewing at InsideScientific.com. The slide presentations and answers to all of the questions that were submitted today will be made available. Uh, we had quite a flurry of activity uh, in terms of questions asked over the last five to ten minutes. So uh, we will make that Q&A report available to all. Please look out for an email from us with links to access these resources. Um, upon uh, completion of this event, you will be presented with a brief survey. Please take a moment to complete the survey um, that will follow the webinar. We do like to obtain feedback from you so we can continue to put together meaningful events and programs for our scientific audience. 
Uh, we do hope that everyone can join us for our next event as part of this Behavioral Animal Neuroscience series on June 11th titled Advancements in Modern Startle Response Systems, sponsored by Kinder Scientific. Um, we hope to see you then. Have a wonderful day, and we look forward to seeing you again at another one of our upcoming Inside Scientific webinars. Thank you.